Good evening. I'm Eric Bierbaum. I'm the graduate director at the Software Center for Ethics. And it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Melissa Lane, professor of politics at Princeton University and founding director of the program in Values and Public Life at the Center for Human Values. But as you'll see from her work, her idea of value is considerably broader than just the human. She is known for her work on Greek political thought. Her first two books are Method and Politics and Plato's Statesman and Plato's Progeny, How Plato and Socrates Still Captivate the Modern Mind. In her work, Professor Lane has often ventured outside Athens, showing broad interest in contemporary normative political theory. Her just released book, Eco Republic, What the Ancients Can Teach Us About Ethics, Virtue, and Sustainable Living, or I, I think the British subtitle might be pithier for this crowd, Ancient Ethics for a Green Age. Uh, this work testifies to Bernard Williams' thought that the Platonic dialogues were, in a sense, too rich, with too many thoughts and images for them to all have a place in a particular context. And Lane thinks that some of the most urgent practical problems of our time can fruitfully draw upon the intellectual resources of the ancients as much or more than the moderns. She uses Plato's ideal form of the city and the soul as a basis for a new, greener conception of citizenship. Reviewers, uh, some here, have called uh, her work a virtuoso performance, crediting her for bringing moral and political questions surrounding environmentalism to a completely new level. I should mention one disclaimer about the book, the slightly ironic fact that it is only available, Eco Republic, in its less eco-friendly paper form, uh, but I'm assured that that will change soon with a Kindle version coming out any day now. Lane is a summa cum laude Harvard graduate and a social studies major, where she wrote a senior thesis with Dieter Schlar. I'll spare you the inevitable embarrassment of digging up her undergraduate thesis. Uh, but you can find it in Widener. Uh, its title, quite amenable to social studies, uh, is The Flight to Nature as a Mode of Social Critique, a Study of Rousseau and Thoreau. We, we have to dig up everyone's undergraduate thesis these days. It's part of what we do. Will you join me in welcoming her to the Software Center for Ethics, where her topic, this topic of her lecture, Scientific Knowledge and the Ethics of Democratic Judgment, has something interesting to say to all of the constituencies of the center, philosophers, theorists, and social scientists alike. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much, Eric, for that kind introduction. And I'd like to thank you and Larry Lessig for the invitation to be here tonight. So how can lay people and political actors evaluate the claims of experts? This question interests me as part of a larger project on knowledge and political theory. And it interests me also as a scholar of Greek political thought, because almost every reflection on this problem, whether in legal theory or social epistemology, begins by invoking the ancient Greeks for whom this problem arose, whether in Socrates' investigations of sophists and generals, or in democratic practices of judgment of oratory in the assembly and law courts. And it interests me finally um, in virtue of uh, my participation in a new interdisciplinary project at Princeton on communicating uncertainty, um, focusing in particular on the ethics, uh, politics, and institutions of uncertainty related to climate change. And so because of that, I'll focus my in investigation of lay analysis of the claims of experts on cases where uncertainty is endemic to the views of experts themselves. Now, there are, of course, many modern political domains where this question might arise um, in legislative assemblies and public commissions and advisory committees in courts of law, administrative bodies, and general public opinion. And I'll be focusing mostly on uh, a, a broad analysis of ways in which citizens may form judgments about questions to which scientific expert testimony is relevant judgments on which they may then draw in a range of those kinds of political roles. So I will engage with some arguments that have been offered about the testimony of experts in courts of law, but I'll assess them insofar as they bear on my broader concerns. So there are three potential routes, I think, to a possible answer to the question of how lay people can evaluate um, scientific expertise. So the first and most demanding I call the identity route, in which lay people are required to assess scientific expertise on the basis of grasping the very same kind of reasoning 
in the same way that experts themselves do. Now, that route may seem implausible, given that the structure of the problem is, relies on a distinction between lay people and experts. And indeed, for my purposes today, I'll presume that it is um, impossible, or at least very unlikely. But I mention it because I think it often serves as a tacit standard for investigations of the problem that reach a skeptical conclusion, a standard which assumes that, since what experts claim is knowledge, only other knowers could possibly evaluate their claim. So before I introduce the second intermediate route, the one I'll ultimately defend, let me introduce the third and most contrasting to the identity route, which I call the external route. And this route eschews precisely that attempt to evaluate the claims of scientists as knowers on which the identity route relies. Instead, it focuses on the claims of scientists to be knowers, that is, on some assessment of credentials, demeanor, or other characteristics which are conceived to be accessible independently of the merits of their arguments and claims themselves. A number of scholars across several disciplines, again from legal theory to social epistemology, have turned to the external route as the only possible path once the identity route has been discarded as impossible. Some, like Elizabeth Anderson and Joseph Raz, accept some version of the external route as unproblematic. They think it can easily be done. Others, such as Scott Brewer, reject it and thereby take themselves to have rejected the only plausible solution to the problem of lay assessment of scientific expertise. Of course, for Brewer in the context of the courtroom, as I'll discuss further. So I'll argue that the identity route, as ordinarily conceived, is too demanding, while the external route, as often conceived, is too weak. Yet the most plausible version of each points towards a middle way, which I call the internal route. So if we start from the identity route, we can weaken the demand that lay people should be capable of become knowers on a par with experts to a requirement that they should be capable of judging whether certain characteristic forms of reasoning, both sound and unsound, have been used. This is a second order form of judgment, um, which does not yield knowledge, but still makes judgment possible. Conversely, if we start from the external route, we'll find that in order to assess credentials, for example, one needs to be able to gauge broad, broad patterns and forms of reasoning. So the most important forms of the external route can't, in fact, remain insulated from what I call internal considerations. So from either end, this kind of interplay between external and internal assessment is both necessary and, I'll argue, possible. So the internal route, as a kind of Goldilocks solution to the problem of lay assessment of expertise, can be developed with the help of ancient Greek sources, which construe popular judgment as a form of second order evaluation of expert knowledge. Aristotle cast all auditors as judges. He wrote in the rhetoric, we may say without qualification that anyone is your judge whom you have to persuade. Such second order evaluation, I'll argue, requires self-awareness of habits of both good and bad reasoning, which apply to lay people and experts alike. Both need to be cognizant of them, and both can potentially identify them in the reasoning of others. So the ethics of democratic judgment of claims of expertise involves self-awareness of appropriate cognitive styles and possible cognitive dangers on the part of both lay people and experts an awareness that can be facilitated by the public open discussion characteristic of democratic societies and democratic science. And it would ideally be matched by an ethics of scientific communication, which would be a topic for another occasion. There is a danger of manipulation in such awareness of the kind that Larry Lessig has called the Orwell effect, um, in which, as he wrote, when, pe when people see that the government or some relatively powerful group is attempting to manipulate social meaning, they react strongly to resist any such manipulation. But I'll suggest in a final section that this can be guarded against. Okay, so let me turn then to my second section, which will uh, 
uh, amplify my definitions and um, the introduction of the uh, three roots by looking at sources for the three roots, both modern and ancient. And I hope everyone has sight of the handout. There should be a handout somewhere. Um, if you don't, perhaps you can, you can find one um, somewhere. OK, so I'll begin um, simply by offering some definitions. And I'll modify some um, that have been offered by Scott Brewer. Uh, I didn't put these on the handout. For the most part, they're uncontroversial. But I'll indicate one place where my definitions would um, differ from his. So with him, I'll identify an expert as a person who has or is regarded as having specialized training that yields sufficient epistemic competence to understand the aims, methods, and results of an expert discipline. While a non-expert is someone, and Brewer writes, um, well, is a person who does not have the specialized training required to yield sufficient epistemic competence. Brewer writes, to understand the aims, methods, and judgments of an expert discipline. That's the part that I would delete. I think that a non-expert can understand the aims, methods, and judgments of an expert discipline, as I'll argue. But then I'll accept a second part of the definition, to be able to critically deploy those methods to produce the judgments that issue from the discipline's distinctive point of view. So on my account, the non-expert can understand and judge, but can't produce the um, kinds of judgments characteristic of the scientific discipline. Now, if we then say, well, what is the epistemic competence that one would need in order to be able to uh, deploy a kind of scientific expertise, um, we might again with Brewer appeal to Miles Burnett's account of understanding as synoptic and explanatory. So this is a very rich account of knowledge and expertise. And it's one that's therefore not vulnerable to Gettier types of counterexamples of the kind which bedevil many more limited accounts of knowledge. And so for Brewer, quote, it's precisely the lack of this kind of understanding in non-expert legal reasoners that cast doubt on their capacity to rely legitimately on expert scientific testimony in reaching practical decisions. Now that, I take it to be a classic statement of the identity route. The non-experts lack this kind of understanding that the experts have, and so we have to cast doubt on their capacity to rely on expert testimony. Now what's interesting to me is that Brewer um, drew on Bernyat to develop this concept of understanding, and Bernyat, of course, drew on Plato and Aristotle in developing that rich and strong concept of scientific understanding. But I'll argue that the ancient Greeks also offer us a different and equally important epistemic conception, an account of the role of popular or non-expert judgment of such expertise. So I think the Greeks offer us a strong account of scientific understanding as expertise, but they also offer us an account of the, of the lay ability to judge that expertise from a non-expert perspective. Indeed, all three roots that I've sketched in my introduction and that I'll go on to continue have ancient as well as modern sources. And if you consider the table in part two of the handout, um, I was very struck by how close the lists are of possible solutions to the problem of identifying experts that are offered by Plato's Socrates on the one hand, um, that's the second column, according to an article by Scott Labarge, and by um, Alvin Goldman, of course, um, the important modern social epistemologist. And I've reorganized their lists in order to align them. Um, and you'll see that um, the middle um, four um, rows all have analogs in each case. Um, there's a Socratic criterion in row one that doesn't have an analog in Goldman, and there's a Goldman criterion in row six that doesn't have an analog in Socrates, but otherwise the four actually line up. And um, as I've categorized these, you can see that the first two in the thought of Socrates and of Goldman are meant to be, they're treated as, in effect, versions of my identity route. In other words, things which only another expert would be able to judge, whether an expert can teach the student the expertise and whether the explanation or, or argument offered by the expert is sound. But I'm going to argue that particularly the explanation route, as I've already suggested, can be taken in my internalist direction instead. The next three are all examples of my external route, and they're presented as such and treated as such um, in both Socrates and in Goldman's account. Um, 
the idea of being able to judge agreement among experts, of appraising their expertise or credentials, and of judging their track record, all of those are seen as external criteria for each of them, but I'll argue that they actually require a form of internal assessment. And then there is one external root in Goldman, the evidence of biases, that I think might be genuinely external. That might be something which genuinely a non-expert can judge without having to use any internal reasoning. But it's not, as Goldman himself says, it's not going to get you very far. It may only apply in some cases. It may enable you to rule some people out. But it's not going to be a general kind of solution to the problem. So as I've said, I'm going to assume that a strong version of the identity root is impossible, because otherwise we couldn't really set up the problem. Um, but I'll argue that the standard that it would require of full knowledge is not a necessary standard, because it's pitched too high. So having stipulatively ruled out the identity root, in my next section, I'm now on the second page of the handout, I'll explore um, versions of the external root, and in particular versions of mutual recognition and the assessment of um, credentials. And I'll argue that um, both excessive confidence about the external root and excessive skepticism are unwarranted. But we can overcome that kind of skepticism only by allowing this internalist assessment of what had originally been put forward as putatively solely external. OK, so I turn then to uh, the question of the external root and its difficulties. The problem of identifying external marks of authority or expertise afflicts accounts of practical and theoretical authority alike, though it's not always appreciated, I think, as a serious concern. Joseph Raz's development of practical authority on the model of theoretical authority in the morality of freedom did not originally acknowledge this problem, um, as I argued in an article um, in uh, 1998. Um, in a later summary article in the Minnesota Law Review, he did remark briefly that to fulfill its function, the legitimacy of an authority must be knowable to its subjects, since the point is to improve conformity with reason. So there he acknowledged that there was an issue about how the subjects could know whether an authority was genuinely expert. But he still took that, in the case of practical authorities at least, to be unproblematic. He treated it as a commonplace lay task saying we engage in such assessments every day of the week, while accepting the, the implication that if we can't rationally pursue such an inquiry or such an identification, people would not be subject to any authority regarding those matters. Now, I'm eventually going to defend a similar kind of continuity between everyday lay judgments and lay judgments of expertise. But notice here that Raz, in a way, just denies the problem, I think, rather than seeing the need to really develop a full-fledged solution to it. A similar kind of confidence is expressed in a recent paper in Episteme in 2011 by Elizabeth Anderson um, called Democracy, Public Policy, and Lay Assessments of Scientific Testimony. And this paper is obviously very close to my project here, although I come to very different conclusions. So Anderson um, uh, appeals to the procedural values of trustworthiness and consensus among experts. And she offers a largely external interpretation of each. She thinks that both of those are things that we can largely judge from the outside. And she, in the context of considering climate change, um, knowledge about climate change, she frames the problem as one of the general public faced with a broad scientific consensus on the one hand and a few scientific crackpots or deniers on the other. And so in that context, she uh, implies that the crackpots can simply be readily identified and that the external validation offered by agreement among experts and meta-expert credential checking is unproblematic. She does, at a couple of points, uh, refer to something closer to my internal root. But for the most part, I think her emphasis falls on these external roots. Now, given the structure of her problem, that reliance on external roots to root out a few frauds might, might work uh, for those purposes. And I was struck by the fact that studies of Socratic practice have emphasized that his cross-examinations may equally be able to disconfirm some putative experts without necessarily being able to identify all actual ones. So the idea of a sort of structure of disconfirmation of some without claiming to be able to know all 
is, is a common point between Anderson and Socrates, and that has some merit. But I think that Anderson's problem is structured in too limited a way to offer us a general solution to mine. Because citizens need not only to be able to judge between crackpots and serious scientists. In the context of my concern about scientific uncertainty, they also need to judge how to assess and respond to the range of uncertainties that serious science disagree about. And that need can't be met by Anderson's primary and unproblematic, supposedly, reliance on external criteria. But before we develop the need for such internal assessment of the explanations offered by experts, and that will be the area where my solution lies, it's useful to consider an opposite point of view of the external route from that which Raz and Anderson assume. And this would be a view that the external route would be necessary, it would be necessary, but it's impossible, so that we should reach a skeptical conclusion about the capacity of lay people to assess expertise. And this is the skeptical argument which was developed in the context of courts of law um, by Scott Brewer, which I now want to further consider. Now, some aspects of his concern with evidence in the courtroom are inapposite for my more general concern with the formation of public opinion. And so I'll prescind here from the discussion that he offers of the special context of rules of evidence, relevance, and admissibility um, in American courts of law. But I think one feature of the courtroom context can't be so easily left behind because it shapes the general character of his framing of the problem and his solution. And this is the adversarial structure of the courtroom, which neither asks nor affords much opportunity for non-expert juries and judges to make up their minds in a more synthetic way on the issues covered in expert testimonies. Instead, they're asked, in effect, to choose between expert A and expert B deciding whom to believe and then accepting as justified belief or some similar concept the main lines, if not the full package of testimony offered by the preferred expert. But outside the courtroom, of course, in the broader context that concerns me, citizens need not choose starkly between expert A and expert B, but they're in the position of evaluating a repertoire of expertise in relation to forming opinions and plans of action. And in both the court of law and broader public debate, the problem of uncertainty will complicate any idea of a simple menu of choice between two experts. Rival experts may offer testimony about an overlapping range of uncertainties, so that both the experts and their non-expert judges need to assess the theoretical uncertainties with reference to their practical concerns. But notwithstanding these differences in context and framing, if Brewer's argument, which reaches the skeptical conclusion that neither juries nor judges lacking special scientific training can ex assess scientific expertise in, an in a non-arbitrary way, if that argument is sound, it would apply a fortiori to my broader case. Because if juries and judges can't assess expertise in a non-arbitrary way, how can the public in general be expected to do so? So if Brewer is right, the prospects for solving my problem are even dimmer than the prospects for solving his. So let me look in a little more detail then at his argument. So having dismissed the identity route as impossible um, and claiming that any internal reasoning route must be limited to very rare cases of full-fledged rational incoherence, Brewer treats the possibility of some kind of external route as the best case general scenario. So for him, if there's going to be any solution, it will have to come from an external route. And that would include such indicia of expertise as credentials, reputation, and demeanor. But he argues that um, assessing such external indicia would itself require an internalist process. So there we agree. But he says that that's impossible. So we agree that the external route requires an internal process, but we disagree about whether or not that's actually possible. So the three candidates that were mentioned, credentials, reputation, and demeanor, um, he quickly dismisses demeanor um, as not uh, having any kind of reason to, uh, sort of reason that we can rely on in relating demeanor to epistemic warrant for what uh, an expert uh, asserts. And so ultimately for him, the question will rely on credentials and reputation. And he treats them largely as a question of credentials. 
But he argues that non-experts can't reliably assess the credentials of experts. Quote, the non-expert's lack of epistemic competence threatens to deprive her of precisely the kind of understanding she would need to be able to confirm or disconfirm a hypothesis about credentials, um, and so their capacity accurately to identify which experts are capable of producing knowledge and justified belief. So um, let me um, assess um, his without going into the details of his argument um, against the external root and the impossibility of the internal root working as a way to assess it, because it's a very complicated argument, the best way for me to assess it is actually to turn to assessing his solution and to deconstructing the solution, and that will indicate my criticism of the argument. So his solution is that because it's not possible for these non-experts to make this kind of external assessment, his solution is that we have to have one and the same legal decision maker wear two hats, the hat of epistemic competence and the hat of practical legitimacy. That is, whether it's a, a judge or a juror or an agency administrator, the same person who has legal authority must also have epistemic competence in the relevant scientific disciplines. So let me assess that prescription first as a putative solution to his problem and then as a possible solution to mine. On its own terms, I find the solution surprisingly, and I think unstably, self-denying. For a scientifically competent judge who would be in a position to evaluate scientific credentials properly, would thereby be in a position to enter into the scientific reasoning and explanations as well, at least to the level of an internal root. And indeed, in such a case, I think it's implausible that she would not do so. And again, this would be especially true in cases involving significant scientific uncertainties. In these cases, identifying whether someone's an expert by being able to assess their credentials is only one part of the problem. You still have to decide how to assess what she says. So simply identifying the expert without assessing their testimony would be no overall solution to the problem at all. So in a way, I think Brewer's solution has to be stronger than he claims. If, it's, if, if one is going to require scientific credentials for the assessor, then that will enable them to engage in an internal as well as an external um, assessment. Now, from his standpoint, this might still be a robust and challenging result. Because even if he should accept, as I've argued, that judges and juries will need to engage in a fully internal root assessment of scientific reasoning and not just internally assessing the supposedly external credentials, he still takes himself to have concluded that that could only be done by a scientifically competent judge. But is that true? And in particular, for my purposes, concerned with the general body of citizens who um, ex hypothesi lack this kind of uh, special scientific competence, must it still hold true? So now I need to turn to argue that an internal route is available even for a non-expert. And so this brings me to part four um, on the handout. So the possibility of an internal route, even for non-experts, um, one focusing on the route of explanation um, as being something that non-experts can judge, has, as I suggested, important Greek roots. And I want to now Sorry, I should, root and root are obviously two different words, but it has important uh, Greek origins. And I now want to spend some time developing those um, as the, the outline for my solution, which I'll then um, fill in with further appeal to um, modern, science, modern studies of um, uh, uh, expertise and, and non-expert reasoning. So I'll begin with Aristotle's treatment of rhetoric and then move on to his politics to elicit a standard for lay judgment of claims of expertise. And the elements of my solution will be that lay judgment is not tantamount to knowledge, but it lies on a continuum with it. We can't draw a sharp distinction, and the sources of the commonality are available to both lay person and expert to assess. So such a standard of lay judgment will rely on certain forms of internal reasoning by both lay person and expert alike. And I'll explore the requirement for self-awareness of the possibilities and dangers of such forms of reasoning as crucial to the ethics and the prospects of lay judgment of expertise. 
So to begin with, it's interesting to look at um, whether Aristotle himself thought that there were external roots available. Um, and indeed, Brewer, uh, in a brief treatment of Aristotle, suggests that Aristotle equated ethos with demeanor. So when Brewer treats demeanor, he says that's what Aristotle called ethos. But actually, if we look at Aristotle's account of ethos, we find that it, it reduces to, all of it reduces to an internalist assessment of the speaker's explanations or arguments. So none of Aristotle's account of ethos is actually wholly external. Now, of course, we have to say that in the non-bureaucratic context um, of ancient Greece, um, Aristotle doesn't consider formal credentials as a possible external route. There weren't exactly formal credentials, although there were um, some claims that some sophists might make. But he focuses on what a speaker displays about himself and his knowledge in the course of his speaking. And he offers three elements of ethos, good sense, excellence, and goodwill, which we can parse as follows. So good sense clearly relates to an internal root. It's the ability of the speaker to form and convey a true opinion. And the audience, in assessing good sense, has to thereby assess that opinion. Um, excellence is the speaker's virtue, which leads the auditors to believe that he won't, in general, conceal his true opinion for nefarious purposes. And goodwill is, in effect, a situational form of excellence. It assures the auditors that the speaker is well disposed towards his hearers and so will not fail to recommend what they know to be the best course. So one of the three elements of ethos is clearly internal. That's um, good sense. And the other two are tests for the attitude of the speakers to the audience. And Aristotle comments that this kind of persuasion by these methods should be achieved by what the speaker says not by what people think of his character before he begins to speak. So ethos for Aristotle is an internal test. It's not an external one. Or we might say it's one in which the external matter of character can't be assessed independently of the internal matter of reasoning. And so a sharp divide between external and internal can't be maintained. And that begins to be the outline then of my solution, that we can't maintain this sharp divide between external and internal. Now, this discussion in the rhetoric applies to contexts where a, generally, a genuinely scientific competence may not be in question. We may not be talking about expert witnesses, but any speaker. But in the politics, Aristotle broadens out his account of the judgment of auditors in a valuable way which specifically relates to expertise, so to how lay people can judge experts. In a, his famous discussion in Politics, Book 3, Chapter 11, um, and I'll be citing the Reeve translation. I was citing the Barnes um, translation of the rhetoric. Um, Aristotle defends the claim that there are some crafts in which the maker might not be either the only or the best judge. And that's, of course, the case of crafts where those who do not possess the craft nevertheless have knowledge of its products. And he gives, of course, three examples. A head of household judges a house better than its builder. A captain judges a rudder, a rudder better than its carpenter, and a guest judges a feast better than its cook. Now, the primary verb at work here is a verb for judging, um, crinane. And he does use a verb for knowing, gignoskein, but that's a general verb which can also mean perceiving, recognizing, or judging. So he eschews any more specialized verb that would denote a specifically theoretical kind of knowledge or understanding. So his emphasis here is on the kind of knowing that is connected to judging. The users as judges are acquainted with the products of the arts, and so they're able to judge their merits even though they lack the techne necessary to produce them. And I want to suggest that that claim is even more strongly embedded in the notion of popular judgment by the overall context of this chapter of the politics. And this is a context that I think is often neglected in studies of this important chapter, including, for example, Jeremy Waldron's um, famous account of the Democratic Feast, um, one of the images used in the chapter. For the chapter is often read as a very general defense of the wisdom of the multitude. Um, but in fact, Aristotle's argument, as I argue in a forthcoming um, con contribution to the Cambridge Companion to Aristotle's Politics, is designed and clearly in the text marked as defending a more specific thesis that the multitude should be accorded the roles of electing and inspecting 
political officials or magistrates. So Aristotle isn't saying that the multitude can judge in any context, including that of themselves serving as magistrates. Instead, he's saying that the citizens can judge the actions of political officials. And they do that in the terms of um, Solon's um, uh, uh, framework for Athenian politics, that they're given the roles of electing and inspecting the officials. But in fact, the multitude was excluded the, the lowest class of citizens was excluded from holding any of the magistracies themselves. So Aristotle's limitation here to the cases of election and inspection precisely makes his argument relevant to my modern problem because he's emphasizing that non-experts can judge those who exercise forms of authority and expertise that they themselves do not. The challenge of the chapter on my reading is precisely whether and how lay people can presume to judge the claims and deeds of experts. And you might say, well, why experts? These are just people elected to magistracies. Who says that they're experts? But the, the, the concern with expertise here is brought out when he actually turns to try to defend the solution against two objections. And in arguing against both objections, he compares these, the, these magistrates to experts such as doctors. So I think he does have the, clearly the concern that the judgment could also be construed as a judgment of experts and indeed wants to compare these elected political officials to experts. So he gives a stark statement of the objection that experts such as doctors can be inspected or audited only by their expert peers. Writing at 1282a, just as a doctor should be inspected by doctors, so others should also be inspected by their peers. So that's the objection, only experts can judge experts. Therefore, we would have to give a negative answer to my problem about whether lay people can judge experts. But Aristotle replies to this objection by distinguishing levels of education in most crafts, including medicine. One might have a general education in a craft, one might be an ordinary practitioner of it, or one might be an, a master craftsman. And all of these, it's implied, can judge even the master craftsman. Now, one of the peculiar features of this passage, and I think it's not often enough discussed, is that Aristotle actually says that all three kinds of people are called doctor. So even somebody who has just a general education in the craft is called doctor. And he must be meaning to take this status to apply very broadly, given that this conclusion is meant to defend the overall thesis endorsing participation of the general multitude in electing and inspecting officials. So I think he must actually be meaning that this general education is at least potentially very widely shared. It might be something like the involvement of ordinary people, say, in medicating their children at home, and so in sharing in medical practice and concerns. So this discussion further erodes any sharp boundary between popular judgment and expert knowledge. They are distinct, but they fall on a continuum, and popular judgment of expert knowledge is possible precisely because there are certain habits of mind shared between them. Now it's that thought that there are certain habits of mind shared between them that I want to now develop further by using some modern um, evidence because we can generalize that point. If we turn to modern psychological and sociological research, we find other important ex epistemic features which experts and non-experts share, and which the latter can assess um, as well as the former. One, um, according to a study of uncertainty and climate change, um, is a general tendency to overconfidence. Um, so um, uh, two authors in a recent issue of Climatic Change, and all the references that I'm citing are at the bottom of the handout, um, write, there is clear experimental evidence that both experts and lay people are systematically overconfident when making judgments about or in the presence of uncertainty. So both experts and lay people have to beware of that overconfidence. Both of them can be aware of, as it, of it as a tendency in themselves and in the other. A second shared epistemic feature is the need for good judgment as what Philip Tetlock in his study of expert political judgment calls good judgment as a metacognitive skill. Tetlock argues for this as a characteristic which helps to grade the accuracy of experts in terms of correspondence of their judgments to reality and the coherence of their judgments. 
And overall, his evidence shows that what he calls foxes do better than hedgehogs. So these are different epistemic styles. You can imagine in the Isaiah Berlin terms um, what they mean, both in ju making judgments and in not trying to explain their errors away defensively. Now, this is a kind of judgment of experts, whether an expert is judging as a fox or as a hedgehog, which ordinary people could learn to make. It's independent of credentials, but it rather reaches into an internal assessment of explanation. So that kind of assessment of explanation um, constitutes an internal route that may be dis dis displayed and exercised by experts and non-experts alike. And I think we can broaden out that point further, that the self-awareness that's needed to assess the epistemic implications of cognitive style can be broadened to a wide range of cognitive biases and tendencies that both experts and non-experts share. As John Sturman argues in a study of communicating climate change risks to the public, even, quote, highly educated adults with substantial training in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics suffer from systematic biases in judgment and decision making. And he says there's no reason to believe that policymakers are immune to those problems. And he goes on to uh, summarize a number of those biases resulting from common heuristics of the kind that are familiar to us from the pioneering research of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky and their followers. Um, I won't read all of them, but they're along the lines of violating basic rules of probability, underestimating uncertainty, wishful thinking, the illusion of control, um, and so on. But what's most interesting to me is Sturman's insistence that, quote, scientists and professionals, not only ordinary people, suffer from many of these judgmental biases. So these are features that experts are not immune to, but that both non-experts and experts can become aware of and can recognize. And there is indeed a silver lining. So scientists are able to overcome or minimize these weaknesses in part by engaging in learning through the scientific method. And Sturman suggests that part of the gulf between scientific experts and lay people who reject or resist their testimony may arise simply from the fact that the scientists are engaged in an iterative, interactive learning process in which the latter are not. But this is not an irremediable gulf between the expert and the lay. Rather, we can find a solution in engaging the non-experts in a form of internal reasoning developed through engaging in interactive and transparent simulations of the climate. This is the context that he's concerned with. Now, these simulations, of course, are not the only tools that climate scientists use in research. So being exposed to them isn't going to be enough to make one into an expert in the area. But they are among the tools that climate scientists use. They belong to the context of discovery as well as the context of communication. So by engaging with them, the public will be able to get a feel for scientific explanations and to understand their bases as well as the characteristic biases that might afflict them, even though they won't be able to produce knowledge claims themselves. So my suggestion is that a common self-awareness and a common engagement in learning can bridge the capacities of the expert and the non-expert to the point where the latter can engage in an internal evaluation of the reasoning claimed by the former. And our norms of public policy, public deliberation, and public communication need to respect and develop these capacities in the public. So I've argued that internal reasoning by lay people in judging expert claims is possible. And this is a relief if it's true, because it's something that lay people do habitually do. So in a way, we want a kind of transcendental justification of it. It's something that we do do. It would be good to be assured, as I've tried to do, that we can do it well. And I think it's important in concluding this section, and then I have just one final section of the paper, but in concluding this section, I want to stress the value of the continuity between lay judgments in ordinary life of scientific expertise and the kind of judgments that we might be called on to make in context of public policy making. Because even in choosing our own do doctors and other experts, we don't simply assemble lists of credentials. We do consider past results and the testimony of other users. And in complex cases, I think we do begin to assess the merits of certain stances towards treatment in light of the knowledge available to us. 
And that sort of investigation is most pressing in cases of significant uncertainty within the state of expert knowledge. This has become increasingly easy in the age of WebMD, but it was already evident in the case of early AIDS activists who ed educated themselves about the demands of clinical trials in order to advocate for certain reforms. And so I think these points tell against two objections, um, which Scott Brewer, again, and this is my last engagement with, with his work in this paper, makes to the claim of continuity between non-expert judgment of expertise in everyday life and in the courtroom, or for my purposes, more broadly in the public sphere. So Brewer says, well, OK, maybe we can do it in everyday life, but that's not relevant to our ability to do it as a jury or a juror in the courtroom. And so his first objection is that the stakes of courtroom judgment are higher and count for others in a way that personal medical decisions don't. And I think that might be true in some cases, but again, the case of those early AIDS activists was one of lay people bringing their judgments to bear on very high stakes of decisions affecting many others. And the second objection is that, quote, the kinds of expert judgments that are rationally pertinent to legal decisions are not infrequently at the cutting edge of scientific theory or of particular scientific methods. But again, I would suggest that it's not the case that courtroom or public debates are necessarily more dramatically at the cutting edge of science than our medical issues in which lay people do every day have to engage with in judging. Anyone who struggled with reproductive technology or choice of cancer treatments has equally faced the uncertainties of cutting edge scientific research. Okay, so that's my, um, that's my conclusion to my main um, constructive argument would be that um, we do, and in fact we need to, investigate the reasoning of experts as well as their credentials, both in everyday life and in context of public policy. And so if we do so with self-awareness of both the sources of good reasoning and the sources of bad reasoning that both lay people and experts might display, that would be the best and most, most ethical course by which lay people may judge expert claims. Now, just in a few final minutes, I want to change gears um, for a final coda to the paper. So, so far I've been arguing that experts are no better at guarding against certain flaws in reasoning and that non-experts can come to share in some forms of good reasoning. But one might think that one should draw a stronger conclusion from the claims that I've been making. If there are such widespread and characteristic flaws in epistemic reasoning of lay people, Perhaps we should instead charge political institutions with protecting us against ourselves by shaping forms of communication and forums of judgment to minimize these flaws. So maybe rather than relying on lay people to try to do the judging, we should actually do a kind of top-down shaping of the forms of evidence that are put into the public sphere and the way that they're put into the public sphere to try to guard against the very sources of bias that I've suggested are widespread. And I'm going to consider just one example of that kind of strategy, which is authored by the theorists of what's called cultural cognition, a, a certain school of psychology. So this theory that of cultural cognition, as you may know, argues that an important dimension of credibility, of the way in which we will judge an expert's um, testimony to be true, is the positive extent to which a claim or an expert is perceived to share common values with the assessor. And the work of Dan um, Cahan and his colleagues has developed this argument. So one way to deal with that problem might be to treat it as a purely external problem, um, to say, well, it's as if we could, in principle, marry any substantive expert claim to any value stance. And so the solution that these theorists of cognitive cognition uh, propose is to suggest that we have to take care that the experts who present scientific claims come from a wide range of value positions um, so that people won't see any one claim, for example, about global warming, as associated with experts who only have certain values. We have to um, mix and match so that we can neutralize that potential source of cognitive bias. Now, the proponents of this approach deny that it's manipulative. They don't think it poses any Orwell effect. They say the aim is not to induce public acceptance of any particular conclusion, but to cr create an environment for unbiased consideration. 
Um, and Elizabeth Anderson, in the article that I mentioned earlier, for example, defends this kind of view. So she says she endorses a proposal, for example, that when we talk about global warming, we should include nuclear power in the mix of policy responses to signal to individualists that their values are being affirmed. Um, and she comments that this is a symbolic recognition of a value orientation. Now, it may well be that nuclear power should be included in the mix of policy responses, but I think this reason for including it is problematic, to include it simply because it's an attempt to neutralize this possible external um, roadblock to good judgment. After all, we can't presuppose that all positions actually are possible to put forward consonant with all values. What if nuclear power were a solution that ranks far lower on a broad measure of social cost-benefit analysis than others? Should we Im include such a symbolic proposal at all costs merely to lower the cultural cognition resistance barrier? I think there an Orwell effect would, in fact, loom. So my conclusion would be that the way to think about cultural cognition, again, is not in these sorts of terms as if it's simply an external problem that we can neutralize by mixing and matching policies, claims, and value stances. Instead, as with my overall argument, I would suggest that the lesson we need to learn from cultural cognition is that we need to open up the consideration of what values imply and broaden our understanding of what policies they can and can't cogently um, support. In other words, we need again to engage in internal substantive consideration. After all, both experts and lay people may be subject to cultural cognition. And so both need to reflect on whether a given position is merely symbolizing a value affiliation or whether the values in question can be reframed to be related to a wider range of policy positions than one had previously imagined. So again, I think an internalist route can help us to guard against the more manipulative potential um, of some forms of recognizing cultural cognition. Self-awareness on the part of both experts and auditor judger, judgers about what values they hold, what values others hold, and how policies relate to those values goes together with the self-awareness about cognitive tendencies that I advocated previously. This kind of self-reflection is an epistemological requirement of both experts and ordinary judges alike, of a two-hat judge as well as an untrained jury. And I propose it as the path along which a solution to the problem of lay judgment of scientific expertise is most ethically to be found. Thank you. So we will... Uh follow our ordinary convention, and I will acknowledge people um, for the queue. Please wait until you see me acknowledge you to make sure you're on the list uh, so that I don't miss anybody unintentionally. So um, I'll start here on the left, and I see Scotty on the left here. <laughs> do you wanna, I'm sorry, Scott, do you want to push the button so people can hear? Uh, thank you for your paper. It's really, it's really wonderful. Um, <clears throat> and I very much like, forgive me, I have a little cold. Um, <clears throat> I very much like the focus on ancient sources. And I want to begin with your, what seems like a fairly heavy emphasis on the role of ethos. And <clears throat> when I was likening ethos to demeanor, I was not denying that, uh, for Aristotle or in general, that the persuasive power of the ethos comes from the presentation. That's actually a quite a familiar problem with expert testimony, but it's not limited to there because there gets to be a market for good demeanor. So while the non-expert is listening to the, is, is assessing the ethos of the speaker, and as you know, the, the sophists were, the logographoi were, you know, creating the ethos for the courtroom speaker in order for him to persuade them, often by reference to what had happened before. I fought at the battle of so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, right? Even, even Socrates did this right in the Apology. But the deeper question I still have is, <clears throat> So you talk about, well, we can assess good sense, excellence, and goodwill. So I have two quick examples that just like to hear your, your, how your solution works for them. One is, I imagine at the beginning of my article, this uh, is somewhat fanciful, but not too wild, uh, 
debate about whether Fermat's last theorem had been solved, because there was a prize in Germany, several hundred thousand dollars or euros or whatever. And it was first announced uh, that it was solved. And then I'm imagining that, okay, there's a, a trial and somebody says, no, it wasn't solved. I solved it instead. And so how is the non-expert going to assess that? I don't think that they're going to be able to do it by assessing the good sense, excellence, or goodwill of the, the competing speakers who are arguing about things that literally probably a dozen people in the world at that point understood. But a second one gets to your issue about the continuity between decisions outside of the courtroom, decisions in the courtroom. I think of an example that's an all too common and, and, and it's a tragic example <clears throat> in which <clears throat> Christian, science parentist, par parentist, pr Christian science parents do not want to give their deathly ill children, uh, you know, urgently needed from the medical point of view, medical treatment. Now, whom would you, how would the non-expert assess the competition between the Christian science, quote, expert, and the medical science, quote, expert? The problem there would seem to be a question of either uh, a question begging, like, I'm going to ask the medical scientist who among those two experts is the proper experts. That's going to be question begging. Or it's going to be infinite regress. I have to keep asking the next expert and the next expert and the next expert. Or I'm not going to give any reason whatsoever for picking one or the other. Um, so that sort of triad is actually another Greek root, which is the root of per Peronian skepticism. And when I offered my two-hat solution, it was very tentative and it was never intended to be something that could overcome Peronian skepticism. I'm, I'm not sure that it, that it can. Because yes, the judge, maybe we can solve it by a blue ribbon panel of judges or juries or something like that, but they would just be participants in the debate. And then somebody who's a, 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 count, a countervailing expert, I think of somebody like Paul Feyerabend. Suppose he was called as an expert, and he says there's no such thing as scientific knowledge. It's all anarchic. Well, how does the non-expert judge his extra-disciplinary competition with medical science or anything else? So how does the Aristotelian ethos-based solution help us with those kinds of problems? Thank you very much. It's um, a real pleasure to be able to discuss these questions with you. And you could tell how stimulating I found your paper from the extensive engagement um, with it. Let me start with the second question. Um, and in a sense, I want to turn it around, because um, my, my thought would be that let's say that we had the two-hat solution, where we say, well, another expert can judge. It's not clear to me how that solution either would help you with the Christian science um, medical expert problem because you would simply be in the same position that you would have to say, well, how are we going to decide what expertise the judge or the jury had to be trained in? Excuse me? Maybe we're left with zero, I guess. Well, so I suppose, I suppose what, what I wanted to do was to, um, in a way, give more credence to your solution, but then build on it to mine. So to say, well, if we can imagine that the two-hat solution could work, yet it still has these problems about um, ultimately one has to make a judgment between competing claims, then, in a sense, if experts themselves are going to be faced with the same set of sorts of problems and choices in that setting, then how are the non-experts in a worse position in relation to that problem than the experts would be? So I suppose I hadn't realized that you were still tempted even by the Peronian route. I wanted to say, well, if your solution works, then it seems to me that my solution can work as well, because I don't see that, that yours can solve that problem any more, perhaps, than mine can. Um, I, I, I think for both of us, the question will ultimately hinge on the, the question of the standard to which we want to hold this judgment. So there would be one standard of, you know, sort of an absolute truth standard or some kind of, you know, can we make an external assessment about how true we think the, how, how likely we think it is that these people have gotten the solution to be true. I think as you frame the problem in a legal context, it was a problem about intellectual due process. Can we believe that the solution would not be arbitrary? And so my claim would be that my solution for the non-expert can also be non-arbitrary. Now that isn't to say that it's necessarily going to get it right. 
um, any more than indeed the scientifically trained person may get it right in a case which is difficult, has a lot of uncertainties, and so forth. But So I, I think in both cases that it's actually having too high a standard um, for what we think the solution has to be is what makes the problem seem impossible to solve, but that if we can actually lower that standard, then we may be able to find a solution in, to both to my problem and to yours, and in both places where we both um, looked for them. Now, in terms of the first question um, about the Aristotelian solution, um, I actually didn't want to hinge too much on the idea that ethos is enough or all that there is. All I, all I wanted to say was that the appeal to ethos is not an appeal simply to a sort of external assessment. It's not something that you could judge just by looking at credentials. And indeed, I think it's important that Aristotle doesn't see it as the sophist can recite his education or you know, all the sort of places that he's given speeches or something like that. But it's rather something that has to be assessed internally to the presentation itself. And again, it seems to me that that's going to be an issue you know, even with a scientifically trained um, uh, uh, judge. I don't see how that problem is going to solve you know, is, is still going to solve that. You're still going to have the admixture of ethos in the way that um, a speech has to be judged. Um, my uh, interest was rather, I think, more of the weight that I wanted to put on the Aristotelian solution came in the work from the politics chapter, the idea of the continuity between lay and expert knowledge and the role of the user. And I guess in terms of that would finally bring me to a, a, an answer to the Fermat last theorem problem that I think part of the reason that seems so difficult to us is that it's difficult to see how it might be tied to an issue that the non-experts kind of need to decide, how that would be tied to a practical problem that they would need to resolve. Yeah. Okay, so in the case of medical science um, versus Christian science, so my thought would be both of those experts um, would have to lay out their arguments and then the ordinary person, as they would if they were making that judgment for themselves, um, and indeed um, as they would do when they're making any kind of judgment of expertise, would look for patterns of reasoning. So they would look for the kinds of patterns about um, openness to criticism, about um, willingness to participate in peer review, about the breadth of the peer review to which that might be subject. And they would also look for these patterns of characteristic biases as possible sources of bad use. Well, I mean, I, I suppose I'm, I'm, I, it seems to me that, that sounds like the other criteria of medical well, it seems to me that, um, I think, I think my thought here would be, again, in a sense, any solution here is going to be question begging in a way. I think the scientifically trained person, the two hat solution is going to be just as question begging as my solution on this. And then it becomes a question of, you know, so does one go for the radically skeptical conclusion or does one go for the thought that um, the sorts of judgments that people have to ordinarily make does give us some warrant to believe that they'll be able, also able to make this decision. So I think it ultimately comes, I think both of the solutions can be either subject to the question begging challenge or they can be insulated against it. Okay, right here, and, and please announce, identify yourself before you. Steve Helfer, Harvard Law School Library, retired. Um, you make uh, what seems to me like an assumption, uh, and I don't know what it's based on, uh, that for some reason experts are somehow better able than non-experts to overcome and minimize their biases. Uh, and you also make references to climate change, uh, and we had some examples of the uh, well-publicized emails that to me, to me seem to exemplify what we also often see among experts, and that is that uh, when they are challenged, uh, they almost always cloak themselves in authority, number one. Number two, they impugn the motives of people, expert or non-expert, who challenge them, and they question uh, the credentials of persons who question their theories. So I don't see how, uh, at least from my observations, uh, experts tend to overcome and minimize their biases. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, I may not have expressed myself well because the general 
drift of my argument was actually that experts are as subject to these biases as other people. Um, Sturman, I, 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 I invoked Sturman saying, well, there are some forms of trying to overcome biases that can come with an engagement in learning processes, like climate simulations in this case. But my point was precisely that if experts can use those to try to um, self-discipline themselves against biases, so also can ordinary people. So actually, the drift of my argument was meant to be that we shouldn't think experts are necessarily better able to overcome their biases. In fact, both experts and lay people are subject to biases. And that means that both experts and pay lay people need to be aware of those biases in themselves and in others. So, so actually, the, the, uh, there may have been a sentence I can see that misled you in, in thinking about what my general drift was. But the general um, uh, uh, line of argument was actually um, the latter. Francis. Hi. I was just wondering about <clears throat> other sorts of external characteristics. Uh, sometimes people say, um, see what the sci where the scientist has invested his money. Uh, is, his, uh, is he um, uh, invested in a company that is going to profit if this theory is correct? And uh, very often people will say, well, look at these external factors yeah. as indications of credibility. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I'm just wondering what your theory about, uh, it, to some degree, the inappropriateness of relying on the external. Uh, I mean, sometimes I give the example of another scientist who has an opposing theory who's invested as well in a company that will profit if his theory is correct. And if each of the theories is contradictory, one is A and not A, somebody's got to be right. right. And right. so it cannot be the right. case that you right. can simply read off the correctness or incorrectness of the theory from this external. Yeah. Now, yeah. so the thing is, if you can't do it in this case, what, uh, what do you recommend in general that people s stop paying so much attention to these other external factors, like where the money will be coming to yeah. you from, and try to pay attention and grapple more with the issues uh, or the argument of the particular scientist, uh, prima facie at least. Uh, you know, maybe if you, there's no way you can understand it or try to grapple with the issue itself, these other external standards may be of some relevance. Uh, but I'm just wondering about your view in that area. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great question. The, um, so broadly speaking, I think that example would come on the grid that I made. It would come under six. So the evidence or maybe putative evidence of biases. So that's in the grid in part two. Um, and the reason that it might be a putative evidence of bias, that sort of um, evidence, would be, I mean, so there are, for example, um, you know, there's, there's sort of, a, as you know, there's a sort of well-recognized, I forgot now what it's called, but there's a sort of well-recognized effect in the literature where the side that someone is being paid by actually does seem to produce more positive results, even if one doesn't see what the mechanism is of that actually happening. So that would be a kind of putative evidence of bias. Um, but, and I, and I very brief, only very briefly talked about that, and I said, well, it would be limited and it wouldn't necessarily be conclusive. And I think the sort of case that you gave is exactly a reason that it wouldn't necessarily be conclusive. Um, but so my analysis of that kind of case, though, would be to say, well, if we are if we see that bias in either one side or both sides, then that's a reason that we need to scrutinize even more carefully the mechanisms of the reasoning, how the study was set up, you know, whether there were certain aspects of it that we could see might be a mechanism that would have produced this kind of external effect. So it would be a sort of red flag that would tell us to engage in more careful internal reasoning. So I think it's a good point that, I mean, in general, I tried to say it's not that we dismiss the external, but that ultimately in assessing the external, we're almost always going to be led into internal sorts of assessments. And this would be a good example of the kind of case where that would be true. Arthur. Mm -hmm. So um, the way that you've set the problem up, I think that the, um, the impossibility of the identity route strikes not only our inability to um, assess the expert, but it hits the expert herself in her own head, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that suggests that maybe there's an, you're being, being much too demanding. So uh, I'm an expert, and I ask myself in a um, fit of you know, honesty and self-reflection, how do I know I'm an expert? Mm -hmm. Well, I've got credentials, but well, <laughs> well I, um, I exercise expert judgment to 
judge my conclusions, but how do so uh, obviously the, this simply reproduces yeah. you know s sophomore level skepticism, and eventually we cease to be sophomores and we figure out you know there's well, any number of standard solutions or non-solutions to skepticism. But this doesn't seem to be a unique problem f about experts, but rather it hits the expert herself or himself, and so that actually su suggests that you're, you've set it up into a demanding a way. And the solution might be to look at the usual non-sophomoric solutions to uh, to skepticism and. Uh, there are different, obviously, different ways. One is we can, you know, ask ask practical questions rather than theoretical questions. The other is we could stop seeing knowledge as this foundational thing, but rather see it as this kind of interactive web and look for coherence. And if if you go the the, the second route, then you actually observe that um, the knowledge that we need to judge experts is not set up as how can I cross this barrier, but rather it's kind of dispersed in the web of our collective, and not the, not the cultural, you know, it, it's not as if we have these external markers, but rather, I mean, as you rightly say, well, some of us are expert in different things, you know, so we're, some of us are expert in judging experts, and some of us are experts in judging the experts, and it turns out that just as we overcome our internal problem of threat of skepticism, we can collectively overcome our collective problem of skepticism through a dispersed division of judgmental mm -hmm. labor. So that when you set it up as, how do I, the layperson, assess the expert, we, 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 get, we get stymied. But as I'm saying, it's not unique to that problem. It's unique to any problem of knowledge. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a very stimulating thought, because in a way, I think what it kind of suggests to me is that I think you're right that I'm setting it up in rather conventional terms, but then that the terms of the solution that I discover I, it's not Im simply that I'm solving that original problem, but that in a way I'm recasting the terms of the problem and to say, well, so that divide that I originally posited was actually too stark. I think it's still important, though, to go through that movement because I think this way of setting it up is a very common way of setting it up. It goes back to the Greeks. It is, you know, it's the terms of many legal and other discussions. So I think we need to start with that problem. But you're right that the the nature of the solution that I offer to it actually points to a rather more reconceived notion of sort of what we even mean by knowledge and how it can be produced. Um, I, I'm very, I mean, it's, 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 it's very sympathetic to me to, to think about this notion of the um, division of epistemic labor. I've kind of in some other work thought about a division of moral labor, and I think that um, you know, even your thought that maybe some non-experts can become more practiced in judging expertise, one might think of investigative reporters or something like that who develop a kind of nose for when a certain kind of expert claim just might not hold water. So I think it's probably right to suggest that there might be some lay people who develop skills in this area that don't bring them all the way to knowledge, but still may make them better than the average um, person at making these sorts of assessments. Uh, Bill. <coughs> Yeah, so this question is actually related to the last. Uh, and I guess so lurking in the background uh, of your project are these really deep questions about the nature of human reason and its capacities. Yeah. And I wonder if in asking the question at the outset, you know, can lay people judge experts, is really to set up to, at, at too high of a level. So it may not be a question that really ad admits of a generic answer. Uh, and you may ha that may be requiring you to pack too much kind of under one analytic umbrella. Um, and I guess, you know, two ways in which that question really quickly becomes kind of more complex is when you think not only of the type of experts, so, you know, experts in nuclear physics and experts in cooking, um, but also the type of lay people there are. So you can think, you know, it might just be that a lay public in Switzerland has, you know, different educational resources and cultural formations than a lay public in Swaziland. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, lay people in 14th century France yeah. are different than today. Yeah. Um, which means, you know, it, when we ask a question, you know, it may just be much more specific about, you know, can 20th century Americans understand the expertise of the, you know, current state of climate debates, um, uh, the, the details of how that gets worked out. And I think you, when you look historically at kind of science studies literature, you know, it, clearly sometimes people are capable and the lay public is capable of coming to what we think now are the right conclusions. And sometimes it appears from our vantage point they aren't. And the, the details and history of each one of those end up being very complex. So that sometimes it's, a, it's through external justifications, sometimes through internal ones. And you end up get with, a, I think, a similar kind of wordy and much more kind of uh, you know, political and herme hermeneutic account rather than saying at the outset that there's some philosophical answer that says there's something called expertise out there and the mode of justification getting it to it for lay people is always one and the same. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I think that's very helpful. 
um, in a sense, I would say that what I would hope would be that having sketched this broad area where I think the solution can lie, that would then be amenable to exactly the sort of specification, investigation, testing that you describe. And so I think that it's a helpful suggestion to say, well, my, maybe the way I should cast it is that this is at least a possible solution, but it may not be possible in all cases, and it may depend its, its actual viability in, all ca in, in various cases may depend on the characteristics of the lay and the characteristics of the experts. And indeed, I already started to point to that sort of thing with talking about Sturman's learning processes. So we would expect that the people who had gone through those simulations would be better able to judge than the people who hadn't. So I think that's a very helpful way in which I might want to then develop the problem. Again, I think it's worth posing the problem in general philosophical terms, though, just because it has been posed in those terms. Many people have made a skeptical conclusion from considering it in those terms. And so if we can say we're not driven to that general skeptical conclusion, then we have space to make the, this sort of um, you know, more, more empirical and, and, and historical um, investigation in terms that are philosophically um, sort of compelling. Um, I just wanted to say one more point actually on the division of labor, because um, there was one thing that I cut out of the presentation of the paper, which was a brief um, engagement with John Hardwig's work that may, some of you may have been thinking about if, if you didn't read the version that, that you saw it in, you would have seen it in, um, which is that, so there's another sort of set of skeptical worries in this area, which is about um, epistemic dependence. And is it sort of right that I should be epistemically dependent on someone else? So he actually ends up developing exactly a kind of um, web of knowledge where you know, we're sort of dependent on everyone else for our kind of knowledge, but he thinks that that still causes a kind of problem that we're epistemically dependent on others. Um, I think that that kind of problem is misplaced. I would take a broadly Razian response to that and say, actually, epistemic dependence is one of the things that we can choose to do with our epistemic autonomy. And so you know, I, I'm not concerned by that sort of problem, but I, I wanted to mention it in relation to this. Uh, hello, hi, Richard Tuck, uh, Government Department. Uh, I'm very sympathetic with the conclusion you come to, but I was struck by one thing. The, the kind of uh, argument you present for the possibility of um, lay judgment of expert uh, argument seems applicable very generally. That is to say that presented with anyone getting up in front of me, I should, if I possess more or less this kind of skill for assessing the character of argument, be able to judge whether or not this is a good argument that being, is being put to me. But the, arg the examples that you were using, and this was the thing I was struck by, were almost all examples of cases where there is already some sort of organized or semi-organized disagreement among people who have some claim to expertise. Uh, climate change is obviously like that because it's not exactly lay versus scientist. I mean, there may be some skepticism about the credentials of the uh, scientific deniers, but at least they're, they're more trained as scientists than I am, for example. And the jury case, the case where the jury is deciding uh, on the base of expert uh, testimony, the thing is actually set up to have yeah. the conflict between two people yeah. who are already rather... Uh, expert in the field. And I wondered if you were in fact uh, cheating slightly by using those examples where the judgment that the lay person is going to make is a judgment between two already fairly systematic and well organized scientific or expert testimonies. Um, and it seemed to me that it was a little unlikely that I would be in a position to bring an appropriate kind of skepticism to bear on, so to speak, a raw account of some scientific theory which was not already being controverted by someone who was more expert than I am. I think I might be in a good position to weigh the two in some sense, rather as a jury does. I don't think I'm in a very good position mm -hmm. to bring my own lay expertise to bear on something where a great deal of complicated material and background knowledge is simply not being presented to me. And then, of course, that raises it, it further <laughs> issue, as someone mentioned fire up, but I was thinking, while you were talking, I was thinking Kuhn, right? I mean, if it's the case that there is a very, very thoroughgoing agreement on the part of the experts, it's quite hard, at least if what I'm suggesting is true, it's quite hard for us to bring your kind of lay expertise to bear on that, because there isn't already the fracturing in the scientific community that we might be able to exploit. And yet, 
that scientific consensus might be of enormous importance from the point of view of public policy and you know, for the future of the world or the future of our mm. societies. So I wondered what you would say about that and also whether you, one implication, if it's right that in, you already need some kind of debate here, if it's right that we should be organizing debate. In other words, devil's advocate. We should employ experts to bring alternative expertise to bear on these sorts of situations. Even if they're not sincere in the conclusions they come to, they could still function rather like advocates in a course, court of law. Yeah, thank you. Th it's very interesting because in a way it suggests I was trying to say, well, the courtroom case is really different from the cases I'm interested in. And you're saying, actually, I'm still in a way within a courtroom model, even where I thought that I was getting outside it and maybe that I kind of need to be in that position. And actually, I, it, it seems to me that um, the logic of the Aristotelian argument, which as I developed it, is a logic for lay judgment of sort of claims or deeds that these expert magistrates um, have put forward or have, have done, does, and I think it's interesting, I hadn't really seen it, but I think that in some way it does seem to presuppose still a kind of adversarial framework in some way. Um, so that may be right that in a way um, what one needs to have is some kind of loose end in some sense and it might be a loose end of internalist reasoning or it might be a loose end of the kind of external cases that Francis was talking about but something that sort of signals to the layperson, wait a minute, maybe there's something to question here, maybe there's another story here and that's maybe most easily going to be put forward where there's a, a staged kind of disagreement. Um, so. That would, so, so I was arguing against staged disagreements where they were staged to try to vary the values in this somewhat mechanical kind of way that I was talking about. But, but actually, you know, as, as you and I kind of are both familiar with, there's a lot to be said for more adversarial styles of political debate in the British Parliament, for example, um, than we actually see in the American um, Congress. And it might well be that, that debating is the right context that will enable people to bring these skills to bear. So thank you. I may need to rethink my kind of want, desire to depart from the courtroom model. Yeah. So we have um, about six minutes, and I don't want to claim expertise here, but given <laughs> we have at least five people on the list, we're not going to get through every person. Um, so if you keep the question short, we can get through more than we otherwise would. Um, Marsha, you're the first on the list. I'm Marcia Angel. Uh, for many years, I was an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. So in that position, I spent a lot of time trying to evaluate uh, scientific claims. Um, and what I've missed from this discussion is any reference to the data, the evidence uh, that would substantiate a claim. And in my experience, the uh, expertise or even the quality of the argumentation or reasoning was the least of it. It was what did they marshal to support their claim and did that evidence support that conclusion and no other conclusion? And what you would find is some experts uh, of varying luminosity would uh, have, have uh, a lot of evidence to support one claim, and then in the next study, make a mistake. Mm. So sometimes they were expert, and sometimes they were not expert. Mm. Mm. Uh, one way that I do agree with you, though, I, I think that, um, that lay people can understand the nature of evidence much better than they're given credit for. Mm. And uh, at the end of the day, I, I think that the position of almost everyone should be skepticism. Mm -hmm. And the burden is on those who assert a claim to prove it. Thank you. Thank you. It would be wonderful to have a chance to talk with you further about your experience because it's so relevant to this topic. Um, uh, I, I think that it's a fair point. I think that certainly there's a sort of room in my explanation for talking more about data in terms of the nature of the explanation in these cases would normally rely on data, but I haven't said anything very specific about it. And so I, I think it would be an important sort of way to refine the story and to talk more about it. But I'm very struck by the, the, the point that you make about, you know, some people get it right in one study and wrong in the next, which is exactly the kind of, you know, that that's the reason for blind review would be precisely that we would not otherwise be blinded, you know, be 
be sort of um, prone to believe that these people, simply by virtue of their reputation, would, would be more likely to get it right. And that seems to me an important point to make. So um, you know, I think it, in terms of how I would flesh out uh, building a, a richer account of data into the story, it would need to look something like characteristic patterns of relating evidence to data, whether data is left aside, whether it's, um, you know, and, and, and actually, I mean, the, the bit of the story that I could develop further here would be, so Tetlock's fo foxes and hedgehogs is actually very relevant to this because what he says is, it's not just that the foxes tend to get it right more, but they tend to be less defensive about their mistakes than the hedgehogs are. And that that's an important feature is when somebody does get it wrong, what explanation do they give of it their having gotten it wrong? And that there are some people who characteristically kind of blame the, you know, blame the world, as it were, and other people who would more characteristically see that there might have been something wrong in their own procedure. So that, those would be the sort of resources that I would want to draw on. Uh, my name is Kenneth Oy. I uh, teach engineering systems and political science at MIT. And following on Marsha's uh, question to you, if we look across areas or problem areas where we have fights over the interpretation of knowledge, in medicine, the issue of data derived from randomized clinical trials versus observational data comes up. Or if you look at the field of synthetic biology, fights over evidence produced by microbiologists and the biological engineers. Okay, you go within the areas of expertise mm -hmm. and you find huge fights or in defense, what systems work or don't work. You've put your finger on a huge problem. You've offered insights looking all the way back to the Greeks. The question here is to what extent are your recommendations for, and ways out is too simple, but advice to those of us that have to deal with these problems on a practical basis, to what extent does your advice vary dramatically as you move from case to case and domain to domain? Yeah, thank you. So I, I take it that that's a version of the question that was asked here Correct. about you know, how confident can I be that this is a general solution. Yeah. And I think, I think the right stance for me here is to be modest about the claim. It's simply to say, well, I think that it's possible sometimes that this kind of solution can work. Um, maybe that it's not always necessarily true. Um, then you know, one might get into a meta regress problem about how would we know which would be the case. Um, and I suppose I'm wanting to put more credence in, that's where my claims from the sort of continuity of everyday practice would come in to try to give us some more confidence that I think that, you know, when I look at friends who are struggling with choosing cutting edge um, treatments for their five-year-old's leukemia or something, they may not be getting it right, but they're certainly making pretty reasoned, pretty informed decisions, you know, about very difficult cutting edge medical issues. And it seems to me that, you know, we do engage in that kind of thing. And, and I'm more willing to give a kind of, I suppose it's an Aristotelian starting point that as Jonathan Lear would put it, we're cognitively at home in the world. And so we can sort of, it's more likely that the endoxa will give us a starting point for getting it right um, as a way of countering the kind of formal um, moves of Pyrrhonian skepticism there. So before we end, I want to I just make sure everyone's aware of a very different part of our series of lectures that we're going to have next Tuesday, um, which is drawing on a different kind of expertise in trying to line the <laughs> scope of knowledge that we might have about important subjects. Uh, we're going to begin a series called In the Dock, um, and we're going to be in this series inviting periodically people who can tell us stuff from the other side, not virtuous and insightful um, uh, <laughs> scholars, but people who have had a different kind of experience. And the first in this uh, series will be Jack Abramoff, who I will interview um, about corruption. Um, so I invite you to join us next Tuesday. But more importantly now, I would like to invite you to uh, thank uh, our speaker for an extraordinary presentation. <laughs> <laughs>